Hi, welcome to Introduction to Construction Management. I'm Tom Stevenson, and today we're going to be looking at construction contracting practices. This is Lecture 3A, so if you haven't seen Lectures 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, please review them. Uh, so our learning outcomes for today, and this lecture is broken up into two parts, 3A and 3B. We're going to be looking at the types and methods of construction contracting, how we go about procuring the work, and some of the elements of what we need in a typical con construction contract, things we need to consider to ensure that the rights, responsibilities of the various parties that are involved in the contract are protected and that various risks are assigned and that we have clarity. If we have clarity uh, and we have uh, mutual understanding, there's a lot less opportunities for disputes and adversarial relationships to develop. And that's one of the things that we're after, really. Um, so we'll be exploring contractual relationships between owners, consultants, contractors, subcontractors, trade suppliers, uh, etc. And it'll give you a good understanding of the basics of how construction projects come together and how they can be different too, because there is a lot of different ways of procuring um, work in construction. And one, it's not one way suits all. So uh, construction contracting practices, it's a business arrangement for the supply of goods and services. And every contract's like this, between a buyer and a seller. There's somebody that wants to purchase something and in construction it's like you want to purchase the services of someone to construct a building for you or some sort of project for you and then there is somebody that's willing to actually do the work right so you've got the buyer or the purchaser and the seller and the seller would be the contractor or the construction companies and to do this well we need to have contracts you know gone are the days where you would just a shake of the hand would work and you know we we've got a mutual understanding things are much much too complex for that in the construction industry uh, so we need to have things documented because we want to make sure there's clarity of exactly what am i buying and exactly what am i selling because easily between the parties there can be misunderstandings so in construction, uh, contracting is carried out, th carried out through a bidding process. We used to call it tendering. Uh, we tend to use the word bidding right now a little bit more, but if you hear tendering, bidding, um, you know, tomato, tomato, same kind of idea. The project documents uh, required, well, you're gonna have a contract for sure. That's gonna be spelling out what the contract documents include and the project documents, also known as the project manual, everything that forms part and parcel of that package. Uh, we have uh, drawings, construction drawings, uh, which consist of site plans, elevations, floor plans, detailed drawings, and really gives you spatial requirements and how things are to be laid out and constructed. And we have specifications, which defines in detail the types of materials, the installation tolerances, the products themselves, and also gives general requirements as to the things that are gonna be done in pre-construction and site mobilization and some of the things that are to be done that don't even include the actual finished product but are necessary to build the finished product. So we need to have clarity on what the documents are and that they're dated and that we understand which documents because there's always constant revisions as you get into a project. So you want to make sure that the original contract is really established this document dated this date and this is part and parcel of the contract. Uh, so um, the plans, the blueprints, it really they do show uh, what is to be built and the specifications give the focus and description of materials, installations, tolerances, quality standards, and they complement each other. They work with each other. It's not that one is made to repeat the information of the other. In fact, quite the opposite. You don't want to have things in two places that are sort of trying to do the same thing because that's when one might get changed and then you'll have errors. So one is complementing the other and filling in the voids that the other can't do. We don't want a set of drawings that's filled with text that we can't read the drawings. The specifications uh, ensure that that doesn't happen. So 
uh, it, as I said, gives you really a good spatial understanding of the project. Site plan, for example, is taken from the property or the lot survey, the legal titled survey. So it shows the dimensions of the lot and it shows where the building is going to be located on the lot, the setback requirements, the height requirements, all of those kind of things go into that. And then, of course, uh, the spatial requirements of the foundation and the elevations and the plan views. And of course, all of this has to coordinate with the permit office and the regulatory authorities that require information as well so that you can get the proper approvals so you can construct the building. And the specifications now, we use uh, standard specifications known as master format specifications. Uh, the old 16 division format and the newer uh, 49 division format, 0 to 49 divisions, master format, standardized specifications, and they give pr very precise descriptions of the products. Like a good example would be a government agency wants to replace all the windows in um, one of their projects, uh, in one of their government buildings. So they would typically specify maybe three or four approved window manufacturers that they vetted, that they know that they've tested their windows to a certain standard, and that's acceptable for that uh, particular government agency. It might only be two, might be three, but they would have been tested, verified, and then they'll usually say, or approved equal. So if the contractor wants to come up with another supplier and they meet um, their requirements, the government agencies, uh, then that could be approved later on. Uh, but it's very specific. It may not be approved too. So you have to make sure if you're pricing it that you're using those products. And if I'm pricing it, it's very helpful for me to know, okay, so these three window companies, they're approved. So I would get a price from each one and I would see uh, which one is the most competitive and all things being equal, I would go with the most competitive one unless I feel one's not going to deliver them on time or there's other criteria that I don't like about some of the other ones. So it gives me the criteria. Otherwise, I just if it was just windows, all right, well, I just go out there and pick any windows, whatever's the cheapest one. You can think about specifications with, in terms of uh, your house, all right? So a bathroom uh, has a base, it has a faucets. So you have the faucets in the bathroom. Well, you know what? I can pick up faucets from Canadian Tire for probably about $25. But I could also get a very expensive set of faucets that are real gold plated. Rubinet is a company that makes very high end faucets. And instead of being $25, it might be $2,500 or $3,500. Big difference between $25 for a faucet and $3,500 for a faucet. Specifications, you will know which one that you can use. And that allows you to estimate it so that then when a client gets prices, they can compare. They know that it's based, or at least it should be, based on the drawings and specifications for that project. There's clarity, transparency, understanding. So specifications uh, need to be really read well. You have to read them thoroughly. One sentence in a set of specifications can give you a quite a different result. Uh, I know personally, you know, I've, I've sometimes gotten a little bit complacent when I price some projects and I missed a line on the specification, then later on it's it's hurt because maybe I assumed uh, that it was going to be a certain price and it ended up being um, substantially more. There's this old saying that if I had a whiteboard that I would probably write on it and I'd put assume on the board. And if you get the word assume on the board, you can circle ass, you, and me. So when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, that causes problems. So you gotta be careful in construction that you're very thorough and you look through things very, very carefully. Um, so why construction uh, uh, contracts are important, you know, it, it would be ideal in construction uh, if we could, if it could be done with a handshake, as I said earlier, but we need more than that. Uh, in Canada, we use, uh, CCDC documents, Canadian Construction Documents Committee. And a typical CCDC2 contract is like for a lump sum type project where you where the buyer wants to know exactly what it's going to cost before they enter into an agreement. Pretty common type of contract, although it's been getting less common in recent years because of the complexity in construction projects. In some cases, it may not be the best choice. 
but a lot of clients do like CCDC2 in the sense I know what the total price is before I start the work and I know what I've got to pay out in theory. Uh, that kind of goes out the wash when you have to make a ton of changes because you didn't really know what you wanted and the specifications weren't that done that well or the drawings or the scope of work wasn't that well defined. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go through the course because it is a big deal. So uh, definitely we're far from perfect in this industry and clients are far from perfect and there's a lot of complications arise when we don't have a clearly spelled out contract or clear documentation for the contract. So it's really important uh, to uh, ensure that we do have a contract. And as I mentioned, CCDC uh, contracts, it's, it's a committee that's been formed by all members in the construction industry from uh, architects, consultants, engineering firms, subcontractors, uh, the uh, GCs themselves, a lot of the associations like the Canadian Construction Association have been heavily involved in, in Mechanical Contractors Association, etc. have been heavily involved in collaborating and working with, with um, the co standard contract to have a very usable, viable uh, contract that has been run through the Canadian court system uh, is constantly been updated and reviewed. So it is a well-known document and it also makes it easier for those in the industry uh, that you get comfortable with what's the format, style, and typical content. There's always variations within the content, but at least it's a format that you know and understand. So a contract is a binding agreement between two or more people and uh, it's legally enforceable. Uh, it, it should describe uh, the terms of the agreement, so what the agreement is all about. And really the parties that have signed up for the contract, they have an obligation um, to upload the terms of the contract and understand what they mean. And if there's something that they don't understand, they should get clarity on that and they should ask the right questions before signing any contract. So you should really make sure that you know what you're doing before you actually sign the contract. And again, any contract contracts of any kind of size, it is always best to get the proper legal advice on. And when we're talking about legal advice, you want to get legal advice from people that specialize in that kind of law, construction law in those cases, because it is a very specialized area and you want people that are knowledgeable in that niche uh, market. So that's something to consider. And when we think about the key elements of construction contracts, there's a lot more than just this to it, but we can, you know, there's the whole, the parties involved. There's a lot more than just this. So we're just covering sort of high level uh, on this particular course to give bridge some understanding, but payment, scope of work, authority, change orders, and the schedule of the work. So let's take a look at each one of those in a little bit more detail. So payment, we want to know, and these, these little snippets that I got at the top of the screen are just from a CCDC2 contract and from the index for the contract, just to give you an idea of some of the topics that they would have uh, under payment. So like financing information, applications for progress payment, uh, so how you apply for the progress payment to be paid in stages during the project. Uh, the progress payments, what we call the schedule of values, how that's going to be broken down for the payments. Uh, substantial performance of the work, that's a legal term, and that means that the building is has met its uh, criteria for use. So it, it can be now used as it was intended to use. So if it's a school, you can now have classes in that school. So you have occupancy for the building, the classrooms are set up such a way that they can actually be used. That substantial uh, performance comes before uh, final completion because you can generally use the building and then there's these little things that you have to fix still, but it has occupancy, it's met the safety requirements. So um, that's a key word and a key uh, legal term in construction. And we'll get into that because it's got a lot more to it than just what I just said, but payment of holdback upon substantial performance. There's holdback monies. That are, that are held back from the project as it proceeds. 
So 10% hold back. Part of that is with lien legislation, which requires that owners hold back money uh, from the contractor and it's held in a trust in case the contractor is not paying their employees and pay, not paying their subcontractors, in case subcontractors aren't paying their employees. There's this whole lien system that's involved in construction. So there's a legal obligation to hold back 10% that gets quite complicated in its nuances. And that's, again, another uh, subject uh, for if you're studying co construction contract law that can be gone into depth. And there's even construction lawyers that specialize just in the lien side of uh, construction projects. Progressive release of holdback. So how do we get that 10% released and to us? And there's a process there and that would be listed in there. Final payment. So what has to be done with the closeout of the project? Closing out is finishing the completion, all of the dotting all the I's, making sure everything is done and getting a final sign off and the final payment. And non-conforming work. So how, how can money be held back for money that it's work that didn't meet the criteria, that you didn't satisfy the drawings or specifications? What's the process in there? So payment, that's kind of the, that, that aspect. Scope of work. Well, you want to make sure with the construction drawings that are the construction contract that you are very clear what, what's involved. Like what is this contract include? And so the scope of work is going to uh, identify the specific documents that are form part and parcel of this contract. So in the contract, it's going to list, you're going to list the documents that form part of this contract, dated documents, so you know the version and the date of the documents, and they provide part of the overall um, contract. So specifications, of course, drawings. If there's any changes during the bidding process, we call that an addenda. So an update during the bidding process, maybe something goes out for a clarification. That would be some examples of those documents. And you want to make sure that everything is listed very, very clearly because anything that's not included or not clear can be disputed. So clarity is very important from... Uh, that perspective. So there's usually a statement like this in the CCDC that will say, you know, what you're to include and then you're, you've got room to in include all of those documents and then that would be part of the contract, contract documents. Authority, well, if the owner or client is giving authority for somebody to represent them, uh, then that's usually the, the consultant. So like this little snippet here, authority of the consultant, sort of giving sort of an overview of what that would mean another reference the ccdc the contract is a number of pages long so these are just little snippets that sort of tie to what i'm discussing here but there's more um, to review from that perspective uh, but it gives them the authority to look after the owner's interests during the construction process so they're doing things like inspections uh, they're reviewing payments they're doing a lot of the things that an owner is quite frankly not skilled um, to do and they're hired for that purpose and this is to allow things to run a lot smoother. Uh, construction contracting, contracting practice with regards to change orders. You know, there's this kind of view in the construction industry that um, a change order uh, is where contractors make all their money. I'm going to say that that's not necessarily true. Small change orders can absolutely drive a contractor crazy. Uh, big change orders, yeah, they can they can be very profitable. You know, the, the owner decides they want to put a another addition onto the side of the building or something. It's a big sort of add on to the project. Those can be very very lucrative from that perspective. But all the little tiny changes, and by the time you do all the administrative processes that's involved. And owners being skeptical, skeptical about signing off on changes uh, makes it quite a laborious process. And it also makes it an area for conflict. Depends what the change is. If the owner wants something more added to it, well, at least there's some value that the owner's getting. But very often changes are involved where there is something, an omission in the drawings, an error, a design error, or something incorrect in the specifications. And it's not your fault, so then it's really the consultant's fault. And now you want to get a change order, and the consultant's not willing to admit that they made the mistake. And then that can make a lot of 
uh, adversarial relationships, headbutting, maybe not getting paid for the change if you don't have the proper documentation in place. So to try to lessen that impact, it's really well, it should be really well identified how changes will be followed and what, what are they? So what's a change order? Defining them. What's a change directive? Defining it. Uh, what do we do about unknown conditions? How do we handle that? How do we handle delays? These are important elements to sort of have a process in place so that when they do occur, and they will occur, we know what to do. It's not sort of, you know, all up in the air. Schedules. One of my favorite areas. Uh, schedules are very important. We live in a world where clients want things now. They want them quickly and uh, they have high expectations. And construction is not known as being the fastest thing in the world. Uh, we just have to look at road work and things like that and realize in traffic jams, sometimes it's taking years to get things done. <clears throat> so it's important to have a schedule of work, to have commitments from the contractor, when they are going to start, when they're going to complete the work. In some cases, there may even be provisions for liquidated damages where if the contractor takes longer, then there's... Um, payment that the owner can receive because it's costing them money. They can't use the facility for its intended purpose. So we want to have a schedule of work. We want to know uh, that we can update the schedule. So like in the comments here, it's the obligation of the contractor to monitor the progress of the work relative to the construction schedule and update the schedule on a monthly basis. So you always have to read the contract. How often do I have to update it? It's pretty standard in our industry, monthly updates. I've seen them where they're every two weeks. So you have to look at the contract. Again, it's one of those things where you could have one, one word changed in here bi-weekly and it changes, right? So you have to know what your contract says. You have to read the contract. But if you're updating it and you're monitoring it, then that can be very helpful because you can see where there's delays and then you can ask what caused the delay. If you didn't cause the delay, then maybe this is going to cost more money. That's going to require a change order. If uh, the owner's consultant caused the delay, they're taking longer to do um, the submittals and uh, review them and to acknowledge them. That could delay the project, could be on the critical path. So you want to have some accountabilities in there and you want to be able to look at, well, what caused it? Was this an act of God, what we call a force majeure event? Uh, fires in Fort McMurray force majeure event. That would be a good example. COVID-19, force majeure event. Uh, these, are, these are some events you'd have to show how it's delaying your ability to do the work at, at, that was planned. And the better you can document that and indicate that, the more likely you'll have success. So this is a big deal in construction, a really big deal. Uh, all the big contractors, they're working very diligently and hard to try to get better at this. So anytime in your programs and courses that you see this kind of topical area, take it very seriously. So in construction, we have, uh, you know, different sort of methods that we organize the hierarchy. This is uh, probably the most uh, common method. I think we mentioned this in the, one of the previous lectures, but uh, we have the owner developer, we have the GC, and then we have everybody under the GC, so subs, and then they have their own subs or own suppliers. You have the consultants, uh, you have the allied professionals like quality surveyors and things of that nature that are looking after maybe the banks if they're financing it, making sure that the progress draws are in alignment, etc. It can be a number of areas in the allied professionals, third-party commissioning agents, that would be another one. Commissioning is making sure that the building operates the way it was designed, like building system-wise. It's become a very complex area over the years with building automation systems. And different contracting practices, you know, how we can have the relationships and the contracts set up. So here's a few examples. Uh, contract between owner and the consultant. So they have their own contract, right? Owner and consultant. Owner and general contractor, they have their own. Owner and allied professionals, commissioning agent, they would have their own. Contractor and each sub would have their own contract. Sub and each subcontractor, sub-sub, would have it. Contractor to suppliers, that's not shown there, but they would have 
their own contracts there for large purchases. Contracts, so that's pretty much all of these ones right through here. So you get the drift of it. Uh, general contracting, some other uh, contractual uh, relationships that can go on, and you'll see some of them vary uh, depending on the um, some of them vary depending on uh, the contractual relationship. We'll look at construction management type contracts and other ones, so they can deviate from this. But this is actually just highlighting what I just explained: uh, the contract between the owner, contract between the owner developer, contract between the designer. So you notice there's no contract between the GC and the architect, not in a traditional method. There might be in a design build uh, method uh, contract, but in a lump sum, there typically won't be because the owner hired the designers, they did up the drawings, they did up the specifications, and then they put it out for bid. And the contractors bid on it, and then somebody got it. And so if this is the contractor that got it, then they will sign the agreement with the owner. And you noticed when I said a few slides ago, the roles and responsibility of the consultant, well, that would be laying out how this consultant is gonna monitor the work of the GC on behalf of the owner. But at the end of the day, the contract for the work is still gonna be between the owner and the contractor in typical lump sum type contracts like the CCDC2 that we talked about. Design, build, and other formats that can change. Uh, IPD, Integrated Project Delivery. There can be differences there. So that's more or less what I wanted to get through on sort of establishing uh, the sort of the relationships and contract types, some of the basic elements of a standard contract, uh, why we need contracts, the importance of it. Uh, it's a very litigious world. It's getting more litigious. The United States is way worse than we are, but uh, we are still... Uh, Pretty litigious so we have to make sure that we protect ourselves and that uh, this will help us build better relationships with owners because if there's questions or misunderstandings if you can get those clarified in the contract stage then you avoid it when you're in the thick of things and you have processes and you can build systems to ensure that things go much more smoothly and there's transparency and good communication taking place so Hopefully uh, you enjoyed today's uh, lecture 3A. I'll be coming up with 3B shortly and have a wonderful day. Tom Stevenson signing off for now.